If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Good morning and welcome to our service on this 12th Sunday after Trinity from the Upper Diva Benefice. We are so glad that you could join us again online this morning as we continue to worship together. And it is not long before we will be able to worship together in person. More news on that later on. We've got a great service lined up for you this morning and we will begin with the collect for today, the 12th Sunday after Trinity. And the collect is taken from the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord. Amen. And we begin by singing our first hymn this morning. Again, a, a great singer, so please do stand if you are able and sing as loud as you can. All my hope on God is founded.
grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And we pray together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire for love for you, now and forever. Amen. And now we hear the first of our two readings, and the first reading is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, which is read to us this morning by Lisanne. This reading is taken from Romans. Chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Lisanne. And our second reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, and it is going to be read to us this morning by Amy. Matthew chapter 16 verses 21 to 28. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I tell you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Amy. Two really powerful readings read to us so brilliantly this morning. And so before we head over to John in Stoke Charity and we hear his message, we are going to sing our second hymn, which is, Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed.
we live in an age of celebrity, an age where our young people crave after fame and riches because of celebrity. It's, and it's easy to see why, when pop stars and football players can be so richly rewarded and where academic excellence and hard graft is so poorly rewarded. But we need to be able to respond to this culture of celebrity that our young people are immersed in. Somehow we have to relate our faith to that culture. So what does our Christian faith say to today's young people? Recent surveys suggest that 95% of our young people don't go to church. So there's a big gap and somehow we have to relate the claims of Jesus on our lives to the lives of the young people amongst us. Jesus lays it out in this passage from Matthew in very simple, straightforward terms. First, he explained to those nearest and dearest to him that for him to set up God's kingdom on earth, he had to die. Yes, he would rise again from the dead, but death and crucifixion must come first. The disciples' first reaction to this was understandably unrestrained. They were appalled, so much so that Peter had to be rebuked by Jesus. And remember that Peter was the one on whom Jesus was going to build his church. Yes, Jesus had to rebuke Peter and say, Get behind me, Satan. The very thought of Jesus turning away from his chosen path and not pursuing that path to crucifixion and death was unthinkable to him. And anyone who would divert him from doing the devil's, would be doing the devil's work. In fact, Peter, on whom Jesus would invest so much responsibility, was at this moment of denial accused of being a stumbling block, a terrible accusation of not understanding things from a spiritual perspective, but demonstrating his feet of clay. Jesus must have been so disappointed at this time. He knew exactly what lay ahead of him. He had told his disciples that he had gone to Jerusalem, which was tantamount to saying that he was prepared to go to that place where there would be an inevitable suffering and death. Even his closest disciples couldn't cope with this. They had been so buoyed up by being with Jesus all the time, by hearing the stories that he told, so excited by the miracles of healing, the parables that he told, that drew so many crowds in. The concept of a suffering Jesus was a long way from their thinking. So Jesus now in this narrative turns away from Peter and directs his conversation to those who are gathered around him. This is not celebrity culture, he explains. There are no immediate rewards. There's no massive salaries for following Jesus. There's no instant fame, no contracts to tour the world. No, following Jesus was going to be quite the opposite. Jesus tells the disciples that following him means denial of self, taking up their cross, and then following him. In fact, Jesus goes even further than this when he talks to the casual believers there by saying that what good is it if you gain the whole world and its riches and its fame and its acclamation, but yet lose your own soul? What can be more important than caring for our soul, our spiritual life? So let's for a moment just examine these three criteria for being a disciple of Jesus. First of all, we must deny ourselves. 
Now this is not asceticism or flagellation as was imagined in medieval monasticism. Such self-denial runs the risk of being just centered on ourselves. That's not the meaning here. Denying ourselves is learning to subordinate our appetites and desires which are contrary to God's way. As we read in the Bible and as we see in the person of Jesus himself. Now this will be different for each one of us and only we will know what self-denial will mean for us. Anything or anybody that comes in the way of our devotion and commitment to the way of Jesus has to be dealt with. Yes, it's self-denial because it can be costly, it can hurt, but new life and a new direction in life is what Jesus is promising when we come in faith to trust him and to follow him. So self-denial. The second is that Jesus says we have to take up our cross in the same way that he did as he came to the end of his life. Sadly, this phrase has been rather trivialized by our generation and all of us have to bear some guilt about that. But this phrase doesn't exhort us to become martyrs, but rather to become fearless in following Jesus, who, as we know, was a crucified Lord. And some translations include the word daily, after taking up our cross. Take up your cross daily. Daily seek strength to be fearless and courageous in following Jesus and accepting him in our hearts. As I said, the phrase has been trivialized by being used to describe daily minor annoyances or family problems as crosses that we have to bear. But the cross 2000 years ago didn't just symbolize death, but a shameful death. And to take up one's cross meant to accept ridicule and hostility from those whose thinking reflected the world's thinking and the culture of ease and celebrity that we're thinking about this morning. We must be prepared to be rejected just as our master was rejected. And it's only by learning from Jesus that we're able to remain obedient to him in a disobedient world. So Jesus lays it on the line to us Becoming one of his disciples, learning to follow him, means that we have to learn to take up our cross. If we seek to live our lives using the means that the world offers to ensure immediate acclaim and a quick fix reward, then the, our lives will be lost. Jesus isn't saying that if we learn to live unselfishly that we will live more satisfying lives. He doesn't say that, but rather that any sacrifices we make may be taken for his sake. The crosses we bear must be ones that are determined by his cross. What Jesus asks of us makes no sense if Jesus is not who he says he is. You don't ask those who follow you to follow you to a cross unless you are the Son of God. From the time that Jesus called his disciples, they were beginning to lose their lives. He had led those 12 disciples through cities and villages of Israel, and now he's turning to Jerusalem to face those who were determined to kill him. He clearly indicates the journey they're beginning. He doesn't try to coerce them to follow him. There's no promise of big rewards and a secure future. No. They follow him willingly, even though we know at the end they would abandon him. And for us, the challenge is unchanging that comes down to us over the centuries. 
In the parallel passage in Luke's Gospel, we read, what folly to strive to become immensely wealthy and then die. Luke 13, verse 13. And in Mark, why forfeit eternal life by focusing all life's energies on this world's goals? The criteria for Jesus, Jesus' disciples, are denial of self, taking up our cross, and finally following Jesus. I read this week of those who are following Jesus in Iran. The thought police, the whole political system there, is against them surviving as Christians. But following Jesus is not an alternative for those brave Christians who have found faith in that country. It's an imperative for them to hold on fearlessly and consistently to their faith, whatever the consequences. I wonder if you have that compulsion to follow Jesus, come what may, whatever it means in terms of your future, your security, your income, your eternity. May the example of those suffering for their faith today give us courage to persist and to hold fast to our faith. There's a course starting online in our benefits on September the 15th, which over 11 weeks will go step by step through the basics of our faith, allowing each of us to respond online in our own homes. It could be life-changing for you. Please contact me or one of the ministry team if you'd like to join us in this exploration of faith. And now we come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for in your Son you have come among us and shared in our humanity, that we may come to you and share in your divinity. You have given us a wonderful Saviour and revealed the depth of your love. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord God, we seek to do your will, that your church may be an instrument for your peace and salvation. We ask your blessing upon all who go out in mission and all who proclaim the good news. We remember especially any who risk their lives or well-being for the sake of doing your will. We pray for all who seek to dedicate their lives to you and your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask your blessing upon all who strive to bring healing and wholeness to peoples and to nations. We pray for peacekeeping forces and all who endeavour to maintain law and order. We pray for the United Nations and for our Queen and her government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, may we reveal your will in our homes by living together in love and peace. We ask your blessing upon our loved ones and our friends. May we encourage one another to do your will. We pray for all who suffer from bad housing or who live in areas of deprivation. We ask your blessing upon all who seek to relieve the needs of the poor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for today for all who are suffering from strained or broken relationships. 
remember all who are a bad influence and lead others astray. We pray for all caught up in drugs or vice. May they be given the chance of a new direction. We pray for friends and loved ones who are ill or who are in trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give thanks for our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Bless your saints and our loved ones departed with the joy of your presence and the fullness of life eternal. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we pray together the words that Jesus Christ himself taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we join in by singing our final hymn this morning, a great hymn with a great Welsh hymn tune, Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
So I do hope that you have enjoyed worshipping together here as part of the Upper Diva Benefice this morning. You have been most welcome. Now, I mentioned at the start of this service that soon we will begin to worship together in community, in person. Now, whilst these online services for me and I hope for you have been somewhat of a lifeline, I can't wait to get back to to see people and to worship with people and to feel their presence in the presence of Jesus Christ. That is something that we can look forward to. So in September, we begin to worship together with a drive-in service at West Stoke Farm on the 6th of September at four o'clock. Now, there's more detail being sent out by the church wardens uh, and will also appear in the Diva magazine, but please do put it in your diary. The 6th of September, 4 p.m., and it's a drive-in service. You basically come in your car, you worship from your car and there will be music where we can sing together and we can pray together and we can be in God's presence together. And then that will begin our worshipping together as we return to our church buildings, which is really something to look forward to. So as we conclude our service, I'm going to conclude by saying a prayer from St. Benedict before the blessing. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go into the world with peace and love to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.